And we'll confirm that we are actually live. <laughs> We're actually live. Sorry, if somebody to go, yeah, I can see you. Oh, you can? No, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me that they can. I'm sure somebody will tell me if they can see me. We are there. We are there? That's good, then. <laughs> we are here, but we are also there. All right, so, um, hey, <laughs> everybody, I know I have a, uh, oh, actually, <clears throat> let me start this over again. Uh, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, I am Flame Ape. I'm Greg Giordano, uh, artist from Vermont. I do comics, I do illustration, and um, I have many really cool creative friends that I've been lucky enough to meet on the internet, and uh, um, one of them is Pippa Bailey, uh, a great friend from the UK, and um, just a little background, um, she is from Shropshire, England, uh, principally a horror writer, independent reviewer, and also YouTube personality with, uh, she is one half of the show, The Ghoul Guides on YouTube. Her supernatural and sci-fi stories have featured, have been featured in uh, a number of anthologies and zines, and her debut novel, Lux, is due for release uh, summer of 2018. It's uh, always a privilege to have her on this show. Thanks for coming tonight, Pippa. No problem. I know, it's I know for nice you, it's back. nighttime. Yeah. It is. It's nighttime for me. It's half past nine, but it's been like, it has been a year since we've done a live stream together. It's so long. It's been a long time. Now, let me get off the graphic and get to the people. <gasps> yeah. uh, is it going to see me? <laughs> now, now everyone's going to see me. Now everyone can see me. Okay. Mm. Um, what kind of cider do you, are you drinking? I'm drinking. I'm drinking Swedish cider called Alska, which is uh, strawberry and lime. And it is, it? Is, oh, it's, oh, it's pretentious cider. It's vegan and gluten-free. Oh, no. I don't think there's <laughs> a, a cider that isn't vegan and gluten-free, is there? I, I don't know. Possibly. It's very tasty, though. And otherwise, I'd be a lot more giggly by now. Mm. That is good. Let's so see. the last time that we talked, it was um, you're saying more than a year ago. I th I think it was I think it was close to like October November two thousand and sixteen. Right. I think it's the last time. Um. I think that probably we're. Probably we were talking about the comic that I do with Bill Woodcock when I'm on top of that game, uh, Holiday Mountain Madness, and um, yes. it's probably because at the time you were really doing a bang up job. Although you still occasionally still do some of that, um, and uh, that you have our eternal gratitude, um, helping us out with boosting up our social um, presence. Um, which I do want to get back to doing when I know what you're up to. It's just yeah. been 2017 was a, a, a hectic, not so great year, but uh, 2018 is hopefully going to be a little bit more organized. Hopefully. Yeah, well, uh, one thing for me is just back on it. I started working on new pages yesterday, and I'm um, hoping that uh, this coming week I'll have some stuff to post. Maybe not in full color, but definitely, um, you know, fully illustrated pages. So that's good. There's been a lot that's gone on on my end, but of course, the primary objective here is interview that yours, but we'll talk about everything uh, while we're here because we <laughs> yeah. usually do. Um, so a couple of things yep. um, right off the bat. You have, when we last talked, you were submitting stuff. And like, I remember there was a short story you showed uh, Bill and I, um, for instance. Uh, that, I remember that, was, that one. That, that was, was my first ever published story. Right, and that was a, a fairly, fairly dark. Yeah, uh, I don't remember if it was a cult or not, but it was certainly, you know, it had that. It was very spooky, and it was, you know, I don't want to give away the story, but but it was a very interesting sort of psycho killer kind of. Uh, yes, that was but, um, but, that was scarred uh, about a girl that was buried alive. Yeah, and had to 
Drag Yourself from Our Own Grave. Yeah, and, that was published and gosh, then January turned. 2000 last year. Yeah. yeah, and that so that was then. So now at this point, you have what is it? Uh, three, five. five stories published. Five stories published. Yeah, five stories as of December 2017. And now uh, you're about to have this book, Lux, come out. Yes, that's the aim for June this year is to have Lux, Lux out by June, hopefully. Um, still got a long way to go. Half of it is on here. Half of it is in here. Here's my trusty notebook for Lux. Sure. I was actually going to be typing up more of it tonight, but instead I'm talking to you because I promised I would. So well, I'm glad, this will I'm, get typed up tomorrow I'm, instead. I'm glad to have destroyed your productivity. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the way, if anybody's watching the show and wants to ask Pippa any questions, um, chat box is open on the right-hand side of the YouTube page. Um, oh. I've definitely got it open so I can see what's going on. Um, and if anybody has a question or Pippa's looking at it, she'll see the questions herself. But you're perfectly welcome to uh, check in and do that if you like. Something. Yeah. Yeah, I can see stuff. Yeah. That's very strange. Oh, yeah, somebody's responded to the gluten <laughs> cider. I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. uh, I think it's on Facebook. That's weird. Oh, it's on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Oh, I don't have any. Uh, I'm not I'm not quite uh, uh, adept enough to be monitoring both at the same time. So. Uh, no, I can't see the or YouTube you can... one. But if you monitor the YouTube one, I'll monitor the Facebook one. There you go. <laughs> so what? So well okay let's get into just the book itself Lux so what's Lux about um Lux is I suppose it's almost a bit of an Alice in Wonderland type tale it's about um a young woman who accidentally falls down a portal and ends up in this other world and finds out that there has been some ancient battle that's been going on for I suppose it's the beginning of time and there's uh, the six connected worlds and um, only two of these worlds remain because four of them have been destroyed by a particularly nasty world. And um, the world that Alex, the main character, has ended up in is, uh, uh, and it works on the premise of an Ouroboros. So uh, Earth, or our world, is the head of the snake. And so long as it survives, eventually everything else could return. They've just got to keep us alive long enough. Um, so it's the first book of six. So mm -hmm. each is going to tell a tale from each of the different worlds as the, the story progresses. Um, but it's it's dark fantasy and horror. Fantasy, but it's got darker and darker as I've uh, as I've written it. As, as I've sort of expanded with short stories, my ability to write has improved. So it's, um yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to getting this finished. And I, I was listening to you recently on the um, oh shoot, what is it called? The ninth. Oh, uh, the ninth story. Ninth, ninth story, story podcast. Yeah, that was, right. that was a lot of fun. It was good. It was a good interview, and that was a um, they're a sort of more or less independent authors podcast, I think. Right. Yes. Yeah, and. Um, you had said on there that this was actually going to be part of a very long uh, series of books. It, it is, yeah. It's going to be. I mean, it's taken me three years to get this far with the first one, but how many? Um, I'm not, there'll be there'll be six, but um, I'm not going to have it take as long for the others. It's going to be one a year. Is the is, aim. is that called a hexology? I have no idea. So just call it a, 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 collect, a collection. Right. Or a six novel series, right? A six novel series, yeah. yeah. Right. But I was thinking about that. Like, is it a, is it a, because a, because a trilogy, right? And, and I don't know what they call a four book. I think it's quad, quad, quadrilogy. Quad, quadrilogy. Right. But, uh, um, oh, uh, so is that something you know because you actually have a, fully realized um you know like a bible or or a plan yes i have yeah i planned yeah. i planned out all of the stories all of the books what was going to happen in them uh three years ago i've just taken mm. 
a long time to get my first drafts done. Um, and I know how it's going to end. You do? I do, yeah. I know what the end's going to be. Do you think that that's rare or common for independent authors? Because I know for comic creators, oftentimes, especially people who are early in their experiences, they don't have that kind of... Um, they a lot of people are by the seat of their pants or, or they're not they don't understand the, the the necessity for that kind of planning so what do you think of that is the do you think authors are more more likely to be you know to have it together um, like that it really varies because you have what we would call pantsers or plotters and i'm i'm a plotter which is a lot of people because i'm kind of chaotic and all over the place um and mm -hmm. i do a lot of different things but i am a planner which is how i'm able to do so many different projects and work on so many different things um but yeah not a lot of people would, would set themselves a task of doing six books or six part silly series it would just kind of continue but i this is something i've been planning for for three years and i want to do it was i, I know if, oh i'm sorry go ahead i was, I was just i just want to get these stories out um s who is the person in our uh, chat on youtube asks and I can only say S because that's the only name that's coming up is S uh, <laughs> asking, uh, who are your influences? Um, I would say Stephen, uh, Stephen King, because everybody says Stephen King. Um, sure. But I would have to say that's more from him himself and not his stories, but his attitude to writing and um, his book on writing. So he's influenced me sort of in regard to how I write, mm -hmm. not his subject matter um because my, my style is very not like his um clive barker i've been told i i seem to write quite a bit like clive barker um and i i i mean the first horror book i was ever handed like adult horror i was seven years old or eight years old and my dad handed me um cabal on the shelf at his house and i loved the covers on these books we had um both sci-fi books and horror books and i just adored the strange like three-breasted women with like giant tigers or like um you know, some alien grappling with somebody and i always thought the covers looked up fantastic and eventually my dad let me read one which i should definitely not have done at eight years old because that story is just right. <laughs> um and other than that i mean really i read independent authors more than i read the big names like i love to read i mean it's like at the moment i'm reading this oh is Spiders in the Daffodils, an American Horror Western by Nelson Piles. And this is a good sideline area too, because you're, um, the way I met you was through Peter, Peter one of the Peter Pagliotti groups, uh, yes. that get togethers, uh, hangouts. And Peter Pagliotti, who is a really cool guy, does a lot of comics, been an anchor since the nineties and uh, also an illustrator. And uh, he's really responsible for a lot of us networking together initially, I think. Yeah, and, very uh, much so. Yeah. Um, but one thing I remember when we first got to know each other was that you were huge, 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 and, and I'm assuming still into uh, uh, Kickstarter as a, a medium of your collecting and obtaining books and comics and other things. You're a consumer, which is how I first met you, was really from that angle. Yeah, yeah. I, it's because I was I, I became a super backer on Kickstarter. You did because I was looking at horror stuff to to, to work with. So when you talk um, about reading independent authors, is that an example of the kind of thing that you get via Kickstarter or other kinds of uh, less traveled roads to find stuff? Definitely, to read or, Kickstarter or, was. Um, I, I ended up on Kickstarter because I wanted a game. There was a, there was a game that I'd seen advertised, and I wanted this game, and then I sort of spiraled into this world of this comic looks fantastic this book looks but i want them i want them all and so i've got a ginormous collection of books and things right but almost everything and, and like all the art behind me right the majority of this art comes from kickstarters as well so it's all by independent artists because i would much rather get something that nobody else has or learn something new that hasn't sort of been out there before i've made some fantastic friends with um you yeah. british comic book creators because i'm actually uh, hopefully at the end of this month a group of us are getting together up in liverpool um, and they're they're all comic book creators, and they're from Kickstarter, and we're going to go and, and have. Get it, so you're going to get together physically in Liverpool. And get together physically, like, yeah. We awesome. managed to meet physically a few times, and it just means we'll drink far too much cider and talk about comics all evening. It'll be good. I, I, I envy um, your such. I would love to be there. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, 
so then do you think that being a consumer and a power uh what do they call it again power, power supporter, supporter yeah. uh super backer super backer sorry sorry yeah do you think that being a super backer and also just as a consumer saying well this is really primarily where i'm shopping right D does yeah. that did did that or does that continue to have an influence on your independent creation now like this is there something unique about that 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 has parlayed into your writing i don't mean subject matter of course but but i mean like your instigation to write or your creativity or anything that drives in being an independent creator or author definitely because i'm actually intending to launch a kickstarter myself this year with mm -hmm. uh, a colleague um because uh, we are making a women in horror calendar mm -hmm um that will be out for 2019 so that's awesome. in the works at the moment now are we is it uh, gonna be um now of course i have some inside knowledge because i listen to the podcast but i'm gonna do my interview <laughs> Go gonna do my inter yeah we just got meta for <laughs> we just got meta for a second but yeah. um so tell me will this will this um calendar be set in perhaps the writer's desks and places where you all write with your studious you know, lamp and uh, desk and so on, or might there be some other imagery involved? <laughs> um, well, we have already approached, we've approached uh, a creator to do our front cover. So that's going to be a combination of all 12 of us lovely ladies. Yes. Um, but I have, I've said because the women, because it's, it's for women in horror and we'll be, we'll be giving a percentage of the profits to the charity. Um, oh, what is but, the charity? Uh, it's, it's just literally two women, women in horror. Um, so I need to get the exact details from the ladies that are just, uh, sort of dealing with that side of things. Mm -hmm. I'm more just organizing. What does the um, charity? What does the charity do? Like provide income or relief, or uh, is it for? Uh, I mean, what what is it? I think, what's I think it's just supporting women's projects within the horror community. So it's helping oh, raise money for women to sort of get more involved in more things. Because there's um, oh, I see. okay. Mm -hmm. There's always, I suppose, and this sounds terrible. Women do get it a little bit harder with the horror community. I mean, I don't know a huge number of people that are women in the horror community i know a lot more men than i know women and because there mm. are a lot of restrictions already on things we can do and how people are supposed to behave i decided that with the calendar i was going to let you're, you're talking you're specifically talking about social um well social interaction so. not not sort of restrictions that are put on us but but a way that ways that we're expected to behave and yes, i okay. don't approve of that because i am terribly badly behaved but i'm very happy about that so um so, i have never, sort of said never noticed that, that. you've never noticed that. that's good <laughs> <laughs> um so i have um myself and kitty kane who are organizing this calendar have mm -hmm. sort of said we want each of the women to own their month they can put anything they want in their pictures so long as it includes them um so we've told them to, to we want their personality there so we want them to, to to be who they are be whatever sort of what what shows them um mm. which i'm i'm you know a lot of people are really happy with the fact that they can just go crazy and i don't want there to be an overriding theme other than the fact that it is women in horror um and we're not all authors as well we've got editors um i'm hopefully going to be approaching a comic book artist soon as we're, we're, we've, we're having a, a changeover, as unfortunately one of the, the ladies has had to uh, pull out of doing the calendar because she's got a lot of work to do next uh, this year. Um, so, so this nice might variety. this so this would have a more than just prose. This might have visual arts and, and other sorts yeah. of stuff. Like that. Yeah, because okay. because there's, cause there's yeah. so much within that the horror world. We don't just want to go with authors. There just is a lot of authors, and it's yeah. um and it's uh, almost split half and half, in, half and half British, half American. Oh great. Um, so it's, it's a really nice mix um but yes i'm i'm biting the bullet with my picture my picture is going to be done probably taken in the freezing cold in april in a pond somewhere what wow. so you're going to be standing in a pond or or something i i will probably be standing in a pond or floating in a pond covered in book pages and not wearing very much but i'm all right with that <laughs> in the winter no in, in april oh in april well that's almost yeah that's close that's that's a bit still pretty close to winter in England. That would be still misery, right? Yes, it will still be misery. Okay. I just want to <laughs> confirm. Yeah, I can cope with the misery. Are you sure uh, about this? Do you have I can cope with the misery? I'm, I'm, the, I'm made of tougher stuff, you know? <laughs> well, it's just, you know, I'm just, 
then we find out about the two the the you know the two years you spend with walking pneumonia after your photo shoot. You know? Yeah. Oh, it'll be worth it'll be worth it for the calendar. Yeah. I suppose um, it's no real different than a penguin plunge, except for you just gotta make sure they get that shot once and done. Yes. And you get out of there, you know, yes. wrapped in a thermal blanket real fast, right? Exactly, um, exactly. Uh so so that's gonna be the first Kickstarter, not one of your books. That's that's the first Kickstarter will be with this calendar. It's not going to be one of my books. I'm I'm probably not going to go through Kickstarter for my books, um, because I've seen with a lot of people it's not been so successful. Um, not for like people's first novel. If you're not particularly well known, it's uh it's not going to go so well. But as I say, I've got I've got a couple of questions on here. Oh, good. Let's see, but, what have um, I got? By the way, Mr. S is actually, I, sorry, I shouldn't presume Mr., but S on face on YouTube is Steve. Steve. Okay, well, Steve. hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. <laughs> um, I have a question from Paul Fluitt. Seeing as you haven't read Barker since you were a teen, which is true, and you've never read Lovecraft, which is also true, uh, what are your writing influences? Come on, give us some new authors to read. You haven't. I, I, have, I have to. I'm sorry to cut in. I'm an Italian. I'm half Italian, so I'm always going to butt in. That's um, fine. So I'm sorry, audience. <laughs> you haven't read Lovecraft. You said that on the ninth story, and I have to I say did. that is. It's by the way, is anything sacred cow about? Like in my opinion, about Lovecraft, and and I, I know some people out there might get crazy about that statement, but in, in that, of course, he's pivotal to American and probably horror literature. Period. But um, uh, um, but it, it is uncommon, right? I would say for people yes. who do horror to say something like I have I haven't read much or I haven't read Lovecraft. So so now I'm I'm just I just gotta I want to get into that. That's fine. That's fine. But but let's get into that after you answer the question, which is your you know, which is this this My. The, someone threw down the gauntlet at you and said no 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 you're not backing out on this question. What are your influences? Um, so yeah, I tend to read indie authors. Um, ones that I would recommend, uh, I would say, well, I'm just going to recommend my, my two favorite books from the last two years. So my favorite book that was out last year, or my favorite book that I read last year was called Nascent Decay by Charles Hash. And that's a sci-fi horror book. And it's brilliant. I didn't know what to expect. It was one that was actually sent. And after I read it, I then went and bought a physical copy of the book because I wanted to, to have it on my shelf so much. Um, I know he's, he's got two other books. One's, uh, he's got the second one out and the third one's due to be released soon, I think, or he's, or he's writing it. And it is just absolutely fantastic. It belongs in the Star Wars canon, but a much, much more horrific Star Wars canon. Um, Interesting. It's just, oh, it's such good books. And um, the other one is um, is a book called Charades or Charades that came out uh, a few years ago, I think, that's by uh, an author called Terry McGee. Mm -hmm. And that one was my favorite one in 2016. And it's a really weird concept book. It's um, short stories, poetry, because he's a poet. Um, so short stories or introductions to short stories, poetry and uh, sections from his actual diary um because uh, you know i mean that book made me cry um because terry unfortunately is somebody who's uh been chased by the black dog for quite a long time and um, it's yeah. it's reading somebody's diary where they're talking about being prepared to jump off golden gate bridge mm. and stuff is you know and then you're friends with this person and it's really hard to see their perspective on life um mm -hmm. but that book was absolutely fantastic so i i really really enjoyed those two so yeah terry mcgee go find him on facebook uh he also works with hectic films in california so you might see him related to that stuff um but terry mcgee and charles hash just brilliant authors absolutely love their stuff and and they don't get mentioned that often um and then sort of in my own social circles i'd say matt hickman jasper bark they're they're fantastic authors british ones these are folks that you know they are folks that i know yeah and uh, Steve has a follow-up. Well, first of all, he says, hello, guys. You're both very eloquent and nice. Yay! That's we're good. You're elo eloquent and nice. I, I like to think I'm very eloquent most of the time. Most people just hear the accent and think I'll be posh, and I'm really not. <laughs> I hmm. don't know if we're nice. 
but I, I'm mm. glad we're coming off that way. Um, I, I, I will be listening to further interviews. Thank you, uh, Steve. And you got to, you know, I'll, I'll definitely be doing more. And also make sure to watch Pip on the Google, the Google Guides here on YouTube. Whoa, yes. there, there went my, oh, you see, you've not put camera down. My, my incredible uh, MacGyvering of duct tape. <laughs> duct tape my camera. Um, and uh, Steve uh, asked a follow-up question, which is, what are your thoughts of slasher-type detective thrillers? Joe Nesbo's The Snowman was a fab read and a real heart racer. Thoughts? Um, I did not watch The Snowman. Did you read it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I didn't read, haven't seen it. I know what it's about. I don't, I, I enjoy watching slashers. I write supernatural horror because my day job puts me in the position where I deal with natural horror and it's not something I want to write about. And of course there's all the slashers in your, in, at, your at the job. There's a lot of people running around job, with knives are, um, and machetes and things. Uh, no, they're, they're forced to leave those outside when they come through security, but wait, um, wait. <laughs> but I've, yeah, I've come, I've come across my fair share of murderers um, sure. in the last year. Whoa, uh, okay. Is this something you want to talk about or no? Um, I, I can't talk about any of the details of anything I deal with. Um, right. Okay. But oh, you're thinking about through the job. I'm doing my day job. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So, oh no, I'm being serious. No, no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> no, I'm talking about my day job. Yeah. Um, I work for a criminal court. Oh, I wasn't gonna. I was gonna try to like figure out something to dance around it so that we're not. Like, yeah. Being too no, that's, that's that's as far as I'll go. Oh, um, criminal court. Oh wow. Ooh wow. Okay, so yeah. you get see, so you have juicy tidbits all day long because you're I do I you're, do you're privy to all kinds of I, in process I, I, cases and investigations, yes. right? Yeah, yes, and I wear the black robes and I get to flounce around to be a wizard of justice, as I call myself, because I feel like I'm in Harry Potter whenever I wear them, and I'm a massive child and I love Harry right, Potter. So. Right, right, right. Um, wow, that's exciting yeah, so, though, in a way. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love my job. It's it's fascinating um i remember anyway, back I, to the oh because i remember when we were last talking years ago now years ago um it was a much drier kind of uh, job that you were doing for yeah HP. i worked i worked for hp computers yeah so it wasn't uh, not exciting <laughs> so i had this vision in my head of uh hewlett packard with people with ski masks and the shed was <laughs> i was like no well, not quite that bad you know they really I mean, like their computers yeah, it's feasible because generally speaking, that work can drive one to murder. But yeah. Um, uh, what was, what was being yeah. asked? Oh, do I like slasher stuff? Yeah, slasher detective thrillers. Yes, I do. I do really enjoy them. I do like to watch them. I will watch a range of horror. I don't yeah. like torch porn because it does nothing for me. And yeah. I also have issues with things where people are force fed stuff or there's like goop on people's faces. It makes <laughs> me uncomfortable. Yeah. And I can't, yeah. uh, it's like there's a scene in one of the Saw films where someone's like drowning in pig slurry. It's like, Ugh. yeah. And um, also, I think uh, any of the centipede films would qualify as oh, double duty yeah. on that. No, I don't want to watch those. Because um, that's torture but, plus goopy. That's torture plus goopy. Yeah, I can't do that. Uh, I don't really like that very much. Um, main thing I can't watch or I can't deal with is anything with existentialism in it. I struggle with physics. I struggle with anything about space-time continuum and the the sort of end of days, end of time kind of stuff scares mm -hmm. me more than anything in horror could. So you would not see a film like Interstellar? No, I won't watch Interstellar. I won't watch um, The Knowing. I won't watch any of the films about the world ending. I Yeah, I can't do but, that. Uh, that last you know, there was that last Lars von Trier film about the planetoid that's like hurtling towards Earth, and people have had like about a year to kind of get to deal with the fact that this incoming planetary body is going to just wipe out the Earth. It's just going to. Oh yeah, I couldn't watch and that. And it's all this, and it's all this, and it's incredible, grim. You know, like people are freaking out, but it's not like panic. It's actually quite subdued and, of course, internalized and, of course, worse, right? Yeah. Because it's not like people running around like crazy. And, driving in the People walls just stop caring. yeah and uh, uh other yeah, kinds of yeah um, so, so that kind of existential dread is it's bad it's called um thanatophobia right I, so I actually have. in that in that so then in that with that filter in mind then probably you shouldn't read much cthulhu mythos much lovecraft right because that's his bread and butter like that's yeah his, that's the gravy that he Nihilism. sells on yeah yeah i don't i, go, I don't deal with that well 
just surprising. I, I, I could deal much more with, with somebody like, um, you know, slicing somebody's throat open and drinking the blood. Fine. Planets exploding. No. <laughs> right. So Steve also is asking, so was John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness the sort of existential horror that you struggle with? I can't have you seen say it? No, I don't think I have. And again, probably mm. because I've been warned about it and avoided it. Probably. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of an interesting film. And it also kind of uh, gra gra grazes a little bit of what would definitely be, I think, a Lovecraftian fan type film. Because it's about a, a bunch of, um, uh, well, it, it, physics, computing, mathematics, chemistry, biology uh, students that are grad students or PhD students. And they're working under a... Uh, a professor who is a definitely a, a philosopher, but also a parapsychologist, and the Catholic Church pulls them into a small chapel that's been in, uh, I think it's in Pennsylvania, but I don't remember, but anyway, it's an old city uh, church, and it's been there since, like, probably the 1800s, maybe earlier, mm. but it turns out in the sub-basement, there's a giant eight-foot canister of what seems like glowing green I Icarus liquid, um, that is radioactive and is seeping out of the canister. And it turns out that a, that um, Satan came to Earth in a physical form, was subjugated, and then his son, which is the Prince of Darkness, his agent on Earth, um, was was also subdued, but uh, but can, uh, sort of put into this canister. And the church, since well, actually, before the church, the twelve apostles were the first ones to, 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 to deal with this, right? So the entirety of Christianity is actually a cover for a secret society that has passed down through the ages this thing about how, like, this canister has essentially the son of Satan in it, and you got to keep it closed, and you got to keep him separated from his father, or Satan from the other dimension is going to come in and obliterate everything on Earth, right? Oh no, so that I would enjoy. Right, and and the and of course, what's fun about it and Carpenter about it, besides all the like funky synth music and the and the and the you know all the classic Carpenter tropes, is that um, we're dealing. You know, we got a bunch of science kids. They're you know, well, they're they're grad, they're PhD grad students. They're like between their twenties and thirties, but basically young people who are trained in science, and and somehow they've got to wrap their brains around something that they just cannot accept, which is that you know, there's a the devil's in the basement, right? And the devil <laughs> leaks, leaks out of the canister and shoots its fluid into people's mouths or opens oh, okay. and turns them into <laughs> servants, which are kind of zombified. But and uh, then and uh, Alice Cooper's in it, and uh, all this oh, okay, crazy stuff. Watch it for more yeah. now. But the other part of it, which becomes sort of the dreadful part too, is that people who are gifted and part of this secret society um, uh, get visions that look like grungy weird video of what looks like like a silhouette of Jesus coming out of the front door of the chapel and they hear this grimy messaging of like we are talking to you from the year 2015 or something like that, the year 2000. If you get this message and then they wake up and people have been getting this vision since like uh, the time of Christ. Hmm. And it turns out that it's video from the future from when the actual Prince of Darkness escapes. And oh, so they're, okay. they're, they've effectively been sending this message through time to try to make people realize that they've got to keep the lid on this thing. Right, so it's like it's so it's not just horror, but it's like sci-fi, and there's all these weird car, and then of course classic carpenter things like the classic Halloween or you know other kinds of tropes that he always like shoves in his movies. So, well, no, I think that sounds like a really good film to watch. I just, um, yeah, it's things that are because that would fall under the supernatural, and I like that, but it's 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 the realism stuff. It's the what if. And the idea of, of my existence, which I suppose is a very selfish fear to have, is I worry about my own existence. I mean, other people, okay, they'll die. <laughs> I would quite happily live forever, even if I ended up being on my own for the rest of time. I don't want my consciousness to end. But I'm going to change yeah. the subject before I start yeah, panicking. Because sure. oh, I will yeah. stop panicking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah, I'll, I'll end up having a panic attack. No, let's okay. get back and I think I've got another question, actually. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. 
I have, I have, and I've probably been told off repeatedly about not reading Lovecraft by Paul <laughs> between between yeah. these these comments. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. What do I have here? I was sure there was something. Um, okay, so where do you see the industry in the next five years? It's changed a lot in the last five, with people self-publishing, more indies rising on the market. Will that continue, or do you think we'll regress back to traditional publish publishing? Mm. Um, that is, I'm going to find that to you first. What do you think? Uh, well, I can't speak for authors in, in terms of prose too much because I don't do that. No, but with but, comics, how do you feel about that? With comics, I mean, I think it's always going to be a mixture, although um, in, in, with any medium, I guess this is the, it's going to be a mixture. You know, because the thing is, um, I'm, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the person who asked the question, but... Um, Paul. Uh, Paul. Yeah. But um, so so what happens with with publishing of any kind, entertainment, you know, stuff, uh, product, is that there's always going to be very very big money product, and and that's uh, your um, you know big publishers, uh, uh, Bantam or or uh, um, uh, Simon Schuster, whatever, right? And books and then records, uh, you know. Uh, 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 Geffen Records or, or Warner Brothers Records or whatever, and there and, and also uh, you know in comics, so Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image, uh, IDW, whatever, uh, Titan, you know in England, um, and then there will always be mid-range uh, publishers. I mean they are publishers, but they are effectively indie in that their budgets are very small, and and then there's going to be independent creators who self-publish right either because their work is insufficiently of insufficient of quality to really hit the marks for big publisher stuff or because it's material that is out of it's hard to place in a traditional yeah. publishing model right yes. uh, where, where genre is very critical or it's really 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 brilliant but but probably for like 90 percent of the population incredibly opaque or, or for the, because they're obtuse and they can't understand it. And I'm not saying they're stupid, but in other words, it's really for a limited audience. And that limited yes. audience cannot support the financial outlay of a big publisher. So therefore, independent self-publishing, direct publishing is, is, is exactly what it's for, for that yeah. book, right? So, like, so, so this is where the things lie, and that's where all this stuff... Um, so, that, so because of that, there's always going to be those different outlets and those different outlets are always going to exist now where it gets into print versus digital i think that the tangibility of the book is always going to have a huge uh, um, effect on the on the on the public new generations of people still want to pick up books nobody's reading kids books to children that are digital at almost at all. I mean, I know it happens, but for the most part, it's still going to a bookseller buying a kid's book. So they're being introduced to a, a book with paper from a very early age. So I don't see it going away, but I think that um, the idea of it, like 10 years ago, if somebody said to me, Oh, what's going to happen to the traditional model? I'd be like, Oh, it's dead. Print's dead. Publishers are dead. Um, because I was very, uh, I drank the Kool-Aid about the new digital frontier. But now that things have settled down a little bit, and I've and I've sort of come back in the middle, I, I realize that I think it's a wiser, it's a wiser prediction to say that both all the models will be there. I will say though that big financial financed publishing of any kind is is in seriously hard straits the newspaper industry and magazine industry probably worst of all of them mm. um and financially really uh, uh, in you know they're constantly like even the new york times has said very clearly that finances on all this stuff is really bad oh yeah well when you can get your news off anything nowadays you scroll on the internet you find it all about you don't need to buy a newspaper anymore um but i agree with you with print. I mean, I would much rather be holding a physical book than I would be reading something on a Kindle. I mean, I have a Kindle. I don't mind ebooks, but when I write something, I want to be able to hold a physical book. Um, yeah. You know, I, I want. I have my little shelf of achievement over there, which makes me happy, um, but that's got physical books on it, so that makes me happy. Um, but yeah, in five years, 
Um, I don't see there being a huge amount of change to the industry. I think we expect five years to be enough time for things to change. And I don't think it really is. I think that technology will move forward, but I don't think the way that we write and the way that we create is going to change. Um, no. And I know it has changed a lot in the last five years, but I think we're kind of reaching the impasse where, um, yeah, well, and also, no offence, but America seems to have gained a few new restrictions recently that may make intelligent discourse and intelligent creations, liter literature and whatever, kind of, I can see it becoming slightly more restricted as to what we can and can't read. Are you talking and about because of net uh, neutrality? Yeah, you're talking about net neutrality. Yeah, I think you know, I, you know, the only thing I can think of, but the only thing I can say about net neutrality is that, uh, or the or the the the, the Ajit Pai uh, uh, debacle is that um, I think that just like in many other ways that America has become a kind of pseudo third world nation, um, and certainly not. I mean, we are the most privileged nation in the world and like our I'm not talking about that kind of third third world but I'm talking about third world in terms of like you know uh, just ridiculous craziness with, with the healthcare stuff and the way, the way we've got things ass backwards with all kinds of other it is things insane. Um, I think that what will happen is just like in China and just like in other countries that, that flip oppressive switches on their internet access I think there'll be a, a lot of people will start figuring out VPNs. I think people will start figuring out, you know, truncating and tunneling options and they'll start, you know, bypassing and going around stuff. And then there'll be a whole lot of people that'll be like, eh, I guess I'll pay more because the same reason why they pay more for cable TV, they'll just like, they'll just, they'll just accept consumer, it. they'll just accept it. Yeah. But I think there'll be a bunch of us who will be like, okay, I'm going to figure out how can I get a VPN so that I don't, I don't have to pay for extra access to sites. And, yeah. you know, and, and I think that, and, and those are usually the smarter people anyway. So I think maybe, you know, maybe that's, I think that'll be part of it. Um, I'm hoping in the, the sort of maximum of four years that you have to suffer this. Yeah. Um, hopefully something's going to change. The other, the other th the problem with it though, is that uh, unless we have a new president at some point that is pro net neutrality, they would then have to appoint a new FCC commissioner. And then that FCC commissioner would have to undo the damage, which that seems a lot far out. That seems farther out than eight years to me. So if, if things get bad, it's going to be bad for like a while. It's going to be bad for like eight, 10, whatever, 12 years. Uh, I suppose, I mean, unless I somebody anybody, has a political. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I don't think anybody thought it could get this bad so quickly. Um, that's why I'm kind of hoping it can get almost corrected just as quickly when somebody in power is not a lunatic. We, we, we would have to have a gigantic groundswell of un. of. of. Uh, of inactive voters pouring out and voting the right way in the midterms and that would include presidential and and mm. such and, and firing the guy if that's going to happen i mean my girlfriend is part of that like incredibly active active you know like trying to actively i think to consider have a solution before legislation does like, there's going to be a widely available tech solution so yeah, my girlfriend yeah. just just uh, interjected that she thinks that there'll be a widely accepted tech solution before there's ever a legislative solution. So yeah, fair I enough. Think, so I we're think, working out. By the way, that's my um, that's my very um, eloquent and nice girlfriend. So everybody <laughs> is eloquent and nice still. Hey, nice. wait, I think she's gonna say hi to you. Hey, hi. <laughs> You guys um, have ever met? I don't think. No, we haven't. We might be Facebook friends. Maybe Facebook friends. Okay, that's possibly. Cool. But that's, so okay, this is also so, eloquent tonight. Sorry, I sorry. Know, yeah. so away from politics, yeah, back to questions, okay. yeah. book stuff, anything, yeah. comics, projects. Well, yeah. So the so the thing is, like, I would say to to just to cap off Paul's thing. In my in my opinion, I think you have a lot of opinions on this. I I don't believe that you don't have a big, a big sort of take on all this stuff because you delve um, into it. Yeah, um, I, I do, and I don't want to go too much into it. <laughs> okay. But I but I think that, you know, there's still going to be books on the shelf. There's mm. there's still going to be books on the internet shelf, more so, independently produced, and 
traditional uh, publishing outlet produced, the traditional publishing outlet is going to uh, not necessarily, it's going to shrink, but it's not going to shrink in power. And it's not going to shrink in certain authors that are famous. No. But they're, but the base of the of the pyramid is, is going to expand drastically as YouTube produced with video makers and um, uh, and I think as comics exploded with independent comics in different phases over the last 20 years, but certainly the last five years. So, yeah, so I think that's what's going on with that. Um, uh, it certainly is making it a fuckload easier for all of us who are, would maybe in a traditional market of 25 years ago, never get noticed. Mm. Maybe never, ever be noticed. Uh, yeah. We'd be sitting there with our vanity books on our shelf, our box, our creative books going around and saying, hey, we want to buy my book. Um, now it's a whole different thing. You know, it's just it's drastically different. And the way that all of us can communicate, um, you know, the way Hangouts is allowing us to all interact yeah. and then interpromote or, or promote each other, you know, like yes. what you're doing on Google Guides, for instance, is not new. There's plenty of shows. Yeah. But, but it's really powerful because you've built an audience and those audiences trust your curation. And so if you tell them to buy my book, it's pretty sure that they're going to at least look, they're all going to look at it. And it's possibly true that, that uh, some percentage of it will buy. Or if you were really like say, hey, support this person's Kickstarter, Joe Blow or Jane, she's got an amazing art book. Uh, you know, it's gonna it it pushes yeah. stuff around. So, so we're real lucky because we're in this situation. Yeah, and, and his book is very good. His his comic is very good. It's very pretty. Thank you. In a, it in is a, very in a cool. dark, it's, it's, twisted, it's, it's, beautiful yeah. way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, um, no, I, I love your art. It's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. And I owe you art, by the way. You do owe me art at some point. I, 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 will, I, will, I, will, I will call in my favors at some point. I like to build up favors with people. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, just, uh, and it's still open. If you want to, if you need a book cover, I would totally, you know, I'll do you, yes. I'll do you well. So. <laughs> I do I do want to get some book art done at some point. But, um, yeah. but yeah, there's not a lot of money in the industry, and we all seem to work on a barter system. And yeah, exactly. I'm quite happy to, to spend my time helping people. Yeah, and that was and that was this thing that was really interesting about how we first met too, because very early in that or in that earliest conversation, or maybe the second one, you were like, "Yeah, I help out like two or three Kickstarters a year, and I really, really push on it and kind of actually yeah. like try to do marketing." And you're like, "I sent you the PDF," and you were like, "I want to help with this book." And you were just like, "You're just like, this is this is a worthy uh, thing <laughs> to, um, to to assist with," and um. That was this other thing that you do that I uh, that's really remarkable, I think, which is that you're super good at building a lot of uh, friends on social and yep. you're uh, in different spaces too. Um, yes. And maneuvering that social uh, uh, likes towards stuff that you think is worthy of being bought or, or kickstarted or whatever. And that's a cool thing. So tell me more yeah. about that part of what I, you I still yeah. do. I still do that. I mean, I don't do it as much as I, I did do because I have a lot of my own stuff to work on. But I do like yeah. connecting people. I suppose I'm a bit of a, a weird one. I, I don't know too many people that are cross so many different. Because, I mean, I work with YouTube gamers, artists. So I, do, I still do administration for an artist. I still will hopefully be doing administration for you guys. Um, and, yeah, I do it for another comic book. Um, I was doing it for a couple of author pages, but I'm not doing those author pages anymore, so that cut down the workload. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like the other day, I um, I've been in contact with a guy that does um, a comic through a group called w w Hooligan, and his stuff is fantastic and it's hilarious, and that's online comic. Um, mm -hmm. but he's doing a Kickstarter soon, and he asked me if I had anything that needed promoting, and I was like, N I don't have anything that fits in with his um aesthetic. Like what I've got is not going to match his stuff, but I do know people that are. So I connected him with the group of British, uh, British comic book creators the other day, and they've all been looking at doing promotion stuff together. So I'm like, yay, networking! I like when I get people to network. It's fantastic. I love, I love That's connecting great. people, because um, I've seen people like get jobs because I've connected them with the right people. 
Right. So like um, the Untold comic, which I do administration for. Which one? Um, the Untold comic. So and who's that by? That's Dan Farrand. And that's um, that's a British one. Okay. And so I introduced him and Carl Jones, and I do I do administration for well I used to do administration. I still sort of help out with Carl Jones occasionally, mm. um, more just moral support and cheerleading. Um, right. And he's he's brilliant. He does um, lots of realism sketches and mashups, and he did some beautiful art for one of the covers for one of the comics that'll be out later on this year. We're just waiting for the final art to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't you know. I'm like, I'm so glad they work together because they're just both fantastic people, and it's like, yay! I just, yeah, I love it. I love connecting people together. I love, I love seeing people network. I love. Um, so my housemate, I've managed to get her, um, sort of met up with one of the uh, publishers that I work with, and she's now got a, a poem that's going to be out in a book um, this year, and she's like super excited because she's never had anything published before, and it's a brilliant poem as well. I absolutely adored it. Um, so I'm so proud of her to, to have like done that and sort of put herself out there and be willing to sort of let people read her stuff. She's very talented as well. All the energy that you're putting into that, however, is mm -hmm. time that could be in writing. Yeah, Are that's you... very true. Now I'm not I'm not presuming that you're the your writing suffering because I know you enough. You're productive. Yes. But there's only so many hours in the day, so. We're, this comes to another creator question because I think people who are listening to the show tonight, I have a feeling, or I know from my end of the woods, there's a lot of create. It's all creative people, um, mm. or people that are really interested in all aspects of this. Time management must be critical for you because you have full time job doing yes. very very important work, which I'm betting sometimes probably comes home a little bit. Um, emotion emotionally, yes, sometimes. Yeah, no, whichever way. You're helping people out with their marketing. One day you're yeah. going to be throwing Bill and I back into your under your yes, room. Yes, I will. Uh, I will. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then uh, just a lot of social stuff and a lot of posting, which is its own job in order to maintain that product, which is Pip and Bailey the product, right? The the sort of social online product. Um. So then, tell me about scheduling. Uh. Um, <laughs> and all that stuff. I don't sleep. No, I I sleep about. <laughs> four hours a night okay. i get up for work at seven i go to work i'm at work by half past eight in the morning i work until we finish court which could be which is sometimes around mostly around five o'clock i don't drive so i have to take the bus home so i lose like half an hour there and then i work until two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning the into the next day on writing mm -hmm. networking schedule things um, there is never a point in the day when I'm not in conversation with somebody about something that I'm working on or they're working on or giving somebody moral support because they're struggling with stuff because I know what it's like to not have any support and I don't want anyone else to feel that way because it really, really sucks. So I try and be there for sort of anyone because I, yeah, I know what it feels like and I don't, I don't want to see people struggling with things. Not, not when I know how fantastic they could be if they just had the support behind them. Mm. It's, yeah, so I don't mind giving up some of my sleep. I just wish we good makeup to hide the bags under my eyes. Tell me more about not being supported because I know that we share ha uh, a similar history in that department. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, if that's all right. Well, I suppose, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, there'll be an interview that will be coming out soon with me. But it's um, I have never really had much support in any of my artistic endeavors or things I've been interested in. Ever. So, I mean, I have a degree as a classical composer and singer. Yep. Um, which you know. Yep. And so, yeah, so, my parents didn't come to see any of my degree work. They've never really listened to any music I wrote um, because it wasn't their sort of thing. I mean, I'm writing classical classical music, music skill, scores for films and television and games. Um, that wasn't their sort of thing. So, they had nothing to do with it. I mean, I love my parents to bits, but then they're, they're not interested in what I do. Um, so, again, if you listen to the ninth story one, that was all about lack of support from family members and stuff i get a lot of the uh, well i don't like horror so i'm not going to read it or i don't understand what you're doing so i'm not interested so I've, I, I mean i i i left home at what 16 and i lived in the ymca because i changed from studying biology psychology and chemistry and was going to do forensics and change my mind and decided i was going to study music instead and i what switches a person from forensics to music um, my maths was not good enough, and the college I was studying at, okay. I was 
severely bullied um, to the point where I didn't want to go anymore. And I would not turn up to, to, to my sixth form. I would go and because most of my friends were in the year below me, I would. So when I moved into sixth form, so when I finished secondary school and started in sixth form, they were all there because they were the year below me. When I hit my second year, they'd all gone to a different college. So I was alone and being bullied and I would miss my lessons and I would travel to the next town to go to their college and just hang out with them on my lunch breaks rather than go to my lessons because I was so miserable. But your but your switching to music must have been Oh yeah, I just it was an intrinsic skill or an intrinsic yes, or a pre-existing I, intrinsic, I should say not intrinsic, but pre-existing. Yeah. Uh, well I was um because I'm a I'm an R I'm a RAF brat, what they refer to as I'm a child of the Royal Air Force. So I travelled all over the place. One of the first schools I went to, the requirement for this primary school was that you played a, an instrument. And being my awkward self, I decided I was going to play the only instrument that nobody else played. So I learned how to read music and play the trumpet at like six years old. I still have my trumpet. I used to have to walk to church with this ginormous trumpet case that was so big I could sit on this thing. And so I'd have to I'd stop every now and again because it was almost as big as me and I'm like dragging this thing down the road and I'd stop and sit on it. Um, and I played in like a... Um, I played with like a famous orchestra in this like big hall and I was like um my name was like put up on stuff because I was the youngest one in the building because I was only seven when I played for this orchestra um but yeah so music I learned to read music at like sort of six seven years old and I still read and write and compose now um mm. I just don't do much with it I prefer writing like this kind of stuff yeah I, I do and I do a so lot of things <laughs> I would you know in fact I would would that would that qualify you as renaissance or as polymath i don't know but um maybe if you had the mathematics and oh god yeah because for me it wasn't my stepmother but my father was um again i think probably not military but a different kind of military in that he was a uh a, almost a priest so there's like definitely another parochial regimented sort of background oh, yeah. and then uh high academic background double masters one phd and so uh, my choices for being an artist were nullified i mean there wasn't even an option and i had to be yeah. a doctor or a priest or a lawyer you know and no backup and but then later a, a stepmother who was the opposite right so that was where i got you know I didn't have to do what you did. I didn't have to leave home at 16. I didn't have to fortunately do any of those things because I had this other parent who survived the, um, my father. And so the, the rest of my parenting until I was, you know, no longer a child was fortunately that person. Right. So I had that lucky, I had that luck, but I do get it because, um, and I'm sure other people watching do because when people just don't get you and it, could be any number of reasons. It doesn't have to be what you're creative with. It could be just your person, yeah. whatever. It can be devastating, derailing, and at least uh, always provide uh, this uh, unfortunate echo chamber in your head of, you know, maybe you're not real or like this isn't good enough. Or if I just did this good enough here, maybe then finally I would get the acknowledgement, yeah. love, whatever. And uh, so that stuff is really rough. And but it can, I, but oh, good. I say no. I was gonna say I, I get that. I still find myself in every conversation with my my mother being like, when I do this, will you be proud of me? When I've mm -hmm. got when I've when I've got an awful out, will you be proud of me? If mm -hmm. I become a best selling author, will you be proud of me then? You know, and it's yeah it's it's hard feeling like no matter what you do you will never ever be good enough and and that affects the rest of my life and everything else i do i always worry that i'll never be good enough for anything so i work incredibly hard yeah uh i think that that's also a common trait because i was uh, i was listening to howard chaikin uh writer artist comics uh, started up in the 70s is still going strong and the one thing that he said was that um you know he, he was the least talented incapable of uh, his generation coming up in comics and had to fight it out qualitatively through you know 100 times harder but also the the, the constant demon is always you know they're going to find out i'm a sham they're going to find out I'm, I'm this isn't real i'm just uh you know it's a fluke or that i'm a, a you know like um you know basically everything i've done is inauthentic and 
Um, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. And yeah. so, you know, and I, and I wonder how much of that is common to people who don't have the backup at the beginning with, you know, their stuff. And then also, um, it also, I'm sure is also fed by people who are actually quite good at what they do and are fighting with their ideas of, you know, it should be this good. It's got to be this. It can't be just yeah. this. And so those two things can really feed each other very well for people who have um, that kind of yeah. uh, self-image or stress and creative, creative no. parents, you know. I, uh, yeah, see, I feel like that a lot. Like, I'm, I'm, I worry that people only read my stuff because they're friends with me or they only tell me it's good because they want to be nice and I'm always terrified that I'm actually absolutely terrible and people are just trying to be nice to me because I don't have I've not ever had that sort of um support there to go hey will you read this before I send this off to someone or hey will you do? I mean the only sort of real one is my, my, my housemate my, my best friend Liana she's um she's been incredibly supportive of me through everything um that I've ever done sort of we've known each other 15 years um so she's always been there. Um, but yeah, you kind of want to be able to turn to your family and say, hey, I've done this. Will you tell me what you think? And I, I don't even get that far. I get, no, it's not my sort of thing, sorry. But yeah, it's I, I do worry that I'm not good enough. Now, the proof of the opposite is that you've been published now in uh, three anthologies, right? Five. Five. Sorry, and uh, you have—is it you have a relationship with several publishers? Yeah, no, no literal relationship. I, I have good networks with with several yeah. publishers. And do you have now? Well, it seems like you have a lot of interest both in getting interviewed, and I'm sure people are saying, you know, when's this book going to come out? Etc. Because you have built a following, so yes. now that you have this interest in your work that is independent of friends, pals, right? Is that affecting that self that self image, or is it affecting that part of the artist that like always ends up like again looking over your shoulder? Kind of um, is that doing it, a, the job that it should do, which is to fight that back? It is in some ways, but some of the the things it's like it'll be close sort of friends of mine or people I've networked with that will go, hey, um, I've put you forward for this interview and and I'll go do it. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's it, it friends of somebody or it's a um, like a small group that want to interview me. And then it's it's quite scary afterwards when I look at other people that they've interviewed. And then I realize it's a big deal because I don't go into anything realizing it's a big deal. If it is, it's like um, I had... Um, I, I did I did a written interview, not yesterday, the day before, that isn't out yet and will be out at some point. But having the um, the interviewees say that he passed one of my questions on to somebody, at a publishing company that he's going to be interviewing. And that um, he said, oh, yeah, go and have a look at them. And they they uh, published um, Miss Peregrine's School for Peculiar Children. And I'm like, what? Okay, that's quite cool. And then um, the the Ninth Story podcast they re they interviewed um, the author that wrote um, Ella Enchanted and Vampire's Apprentice, and these are films that I've seen, and it's really really scary for me to have anybody want to interview me because I'm I'm worried that I'm I'm like I'm not I'm I'm not like these people. I don't I don't even have my first novel out yet. I don't have anything to show for expect of me and I find that absolutely terrifying that I'm doing these things and I'm like I have nothing to show I have a few stories and a few books but I've got nothing that's me that's a bit scary uh yeah I can imagine I mean this is the beginning of a thing rather than I mean because there's a lot of beginnings that happen with any creator and there's like the the first stuff where you're just actually just figuring it out you're just actually learning and maybe in today's world, there's a lot of posting. If you're an artist, you're throwing your stuff up on DeviantArt or something, but you don't have any connection to a job. You've never done a commission. You're yeah. just saying, hi, this is my latest sketch. So that's that beginning. And then there's the beginning where you, you actually network with other people and you're meeting and you're going on forums and you're like sharing stuff and sort of things are building and you're actually like trying to do 
trying to work harder on your stuff and measure up. That's another beginning. And then there's like the first commissions that you get, right? And then stuff starts to trickle and that's another beginning. And it sounds like with you that this is now like, it's like you crested a number of hills and now here's this new one. This is the big one because this is the one that like, if this works out, that then starts the real taking notice out there, right? And yes. Because if, because if you get this book published, if it's actually published by a, even if it's a small independent publisher, it doesn't matter. Mm. If somebody publishes Lux for you, then it will mean that it, it the book has a certain authenticity and pedigree that if you just self-published, it just yeah. wouldn't have that same thing. And that's and that's a scary place to probably be on the precipice oh, yeah. of, right? Yeah, yeah very so much so. I am. I'm sitting here going, I, I don't I don't know when it's written. I'm then sat there going, I need to speak to people about what to do with this now, whether I do go. I do it right. myself. Um, the, right. Does does helping other people out though? I mean, you're helping a bunch of people out that are on all these stages. They're in different stages, and and as yeah. an outsider to them, or as a helper to them, you're totally you're not you're not intimidated by any of this story at all. Like if this story was told to you by me, you'd be like, okay, and so here's what you got to do, and that's okay, and you you do do yeah, that, okay. you gotta work, right? So does that can any of that be re? Can any of that be pulled back onto yourself and say, like, okay, if I was my own client, this is what I would, this is what, how where I would intervene in that nervousness or, or the advice I would give? Yeah, I'd tell them to chill out a little bit about it and speak sure. to the right people and find out what was out there, what was, what was available, who's going to be interested in this type of product. Um, I would make sure that I sent the book to the right people when it came to beta reading because it's always good to get uh, quotes and have the right people read it before it's even published. I mean, one of the first things I read about three years ago when I first I read, because I spent three months planning the book before I even started writing it, and I researched about releasing a book and all about building um, an audience before you ever release the book. And I completely forgot about that kind of stuff. And I now find myself here three years later with a potential audience. And it's all seemed to, to have kind of worked its way out. But I'm still terrified um, because the novel is nothing like my short stories. It's um, because, because I... It's, so go ahead, tell me uh, why. It, with, well, with the short stories, it's... You don't have the time to give your characters personality like like personalities that you can really really connect to you need to be thrown into the action so you, you feel what's happening but um with the novel i've just spent a lot of time with character building and i oh i adore some of the characters i mean they're all little bits of me but just some of them is they're people that i want to meet just because i know i'd have so much fun hanging out with them and i'm just scared that nobody else is gonna like them right um we have some more questions. Oh, do we? Okay. Steve is asking, um, this one's to you both as a comic book enthusiast, writer, artist, horror writers. What are your thoughts on 2080's influence in terms of horror comics? Oh, you'll have to answer that one. <laughs> well, but did you ever, did you read 2080 when uh -uh. you were a kid? Did no. you read any, did you read any homegrown comics when you were a kid? Nope. So not even no, Dino I got or any bought, of that stuff? Like, Oh, well, I, I read Beano, but I couldn't pick anything out in particular. And then I was like given girly stuff. Oh. I was I was brought up with very much read this, you're a girl, and it was like gotcha. got to about eleven and twelve, and it was like, oh, you're a nerd. That's not good. Please be more girly, and then it's never going to happen. Interesting. So, because I would have had for some reason, I would have had an idea that maybe you would have read, you know, uh, either two thousand AD or possibly like uh, Hammer Horror. Or Something like that, you know. Like no, just, it was it was very much comics are for boys, is what I was brought up with them. Okay, I had horror books, but that was it. Well, I you know, I've watched all the documentaries, uh, uh, Comics Britannia, which was a series on the history of British comics. I've watched the newest 2000 AD documentary, and there was one in between. I don't remember where it was shown. It was a TV based thing, but. Um, so I know the history in terms of that. I've read, a, I've watched a lot of interviews with uh, Nick Anglo and all the different people involved in the early days of that magazine. 
and and then and then also just my reading of the material which when i was a kid in the 80s there was very little bit we didn't have almost no access to it except for these um uh, these uh, single judge read stories that be compiled in these big magazine sized paperbacks that you can, i found at conventions um and then uh this guy came in our store with a giant refrigerator crate full of 2080 weeklies because he was stationed there in the marines and um came back with this pile of books and i bought a lot of them i didn't buy all of them but I bought a lot of them and so then i was able to actually read them the, like the way you guys would have been able to read them in the weekly format in black and white you know um with little little tiny fractions of stories in every issue you know um i would say that 2080 i mean graphically must have had this enormous effect on horror in general it seems to have had a cultural effect on comics, movies, horror, uh, 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 writing, etc. Although it's primarily a science fiction magazine, right? Always was, but even material that was, but had a lot of material that also had horror in it, like um, Nemesis the Warlock or whatever. So even some Judge Dredd was horror. Sci it was horror as much as it was sci-fi, right? Uh, like the Judge Death stuff where they go to the other dimension and fight these like demonic versions of themselves and everything else. So. But I think that just on a visual level, it was such primal art. It was such punk art. It was such... It, it, was, it was art. It's art that is unbelievably rigorous and muscular and dark and edgy and like almost like a like somebody like a like an old rusty chainsaw or something you know uh and it and it for me anyway it had a pivotal effect on me much more than america and comics did um and now when i'm trying to improve my inking and improve my drawing especially for extreme kinds of stuff what i look at more is is mike mcmahon and uh any of the various uh early 2000 ad or, i mean the 2000 ad artists after judge dread came around not the original because the original stuff i think was kind of it was more like it looked like the kind of comics that were in action it was a softer line and it was a little more conservative looking but by the time judge dread came around and nemesis and stuff so that material and onward is the stuff that I tend to look at. Uh, so I think it had a huge effect. Um, if you didn't read it, it couldn't have an effect. But I do think that there were cumulative sort of, because it, it because there's so many people who after the 80s became directors, writers, comic artists, etc., that were very much like influenced by 2000 AD. I think even like somebody yourself, Pepe, it would be interesting to try to like follow the the parentage back. And I'll bet that there's somebody in there who was a huge 2008 fan, whether it was a horror author or it was a oh, film definitely. that you really liked or whatever. So um, yeah, I think I think it's safe to say that I think it's I think it's safe to say that it's a monumental effect and influence. I know for me it is. I think it's also safe to say that most people are culturally illiterate and don't know that it affects them. No, um, there had been an attitude for a very long time of it being very much you read books or you look at comics and the yeah. wall between that seems to be breaking down more and more now and I love that people are like, yeah, I love comics and I love reading books. There's no, there's, there's not so much of that um, snobbery anymore of, oh no, high literature needs to be sort of read over looking at pictures and stuff. And it's like you don't understand the value of the art in some of these books and the story writing is amazing. It's yeah. like, Novels are fantastic, but please, God, go look at some of the independent creators because some of the stuff out there is absolutely fantastic, and I, uh, you know, I can't recommend yeah. it high enough. Yeah, yeah, it's it, we're all we're all very complementary to each other, much more than we are at at, uh, at odds or, or there's you know, I mean, there's a, there's I th and I think that our like I'm you know, of course, I'm in my fifties, uh, you're much younger than I am, but still, I mean. Uh, and there's people even much younger than both of us, but I think it's definitely my generation on for sure ha have a much different attitude towards 
accepting all of them as art and also accepting all of them as quality writing, quality, you know, storytelling. So I think the good thing about the last uh, 30 years or 40 years or whatever is that, um, you know, a lot of this snobbery and stuff is, is fairly well getting, you know, uh, shunted to the, to the sides. Uh, outlying there are there are more outlier opinions i think than than mainstream or or uh, opinions that have effect on anything so i think that's a good thing yeah yeah because i mean i suppose because i'm i'm well i'll be 30 this year and i've been working with this stuff for three or four years so i suppose i've been exposed to this for, for three or four years now and it's yeah i mean i i rarely see anybody with those opinions but i but i'm i'm aware of how bad it has been in the past yeah. with, with the attitudes across um and you still get them now unfortunately in, in the horror scene you get the attitudes between um dealing with uh well, bizarro horror versus supernatural horror or people that write stuff to do with zombies or whatever you get you get different attitudes to all the categories as to what's better than this and what's better than that when really we should all just be saying we're all creators can't that just be fantastic as it is and accept that we all make amazing stuff it doesn't have to be to your taste to be amazing it just means it's not to your taste it is like that in comics too unfortunately in terms of um, the difference between what's essentially genre and what is um, uh, I guess being so loosely called like literary comics, stuff that would be recognized by the New York Times bestseller list or stuff that would be recognized by uh, comics literature, uh, academia at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like a, let's say like at a Columbia or NYU or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that material is not the material that sells to those who buy genre and, and the, the no. crossover is not there. And there can be a lot of, distance and problems between the two and i even experienced some of it being in uh, one of the people in charge of the comics group of the represent vermont creators so there's still a lot of diversity but but there's a lot of folks who are more on the high art uh kind of uh, indie and indie meaning not just indie but indie and also literate or indie and also you know um contemporary art comics or whatever and then the other folks who are doing essentially genre stuff because they would love they you know, maybe they would want to work for dc and marvel but they're not you know they're yeah. putting out their own material and there are separate there are huge divide, dividing lines between the two groups however we socialize so we try to break those down but it's true that in in philosophy and stuff they're big walls yeah. And so oh, I can yeah. see the same thing in writing, even within horror. In fact, I would imagine the narrower you go, the more potential infighting there can be. Um, oh yeah, there, there is a lot of inside fighting. But I was gonna say, you, you do find it's like it's like with people's opinions on films now. It's like, um, and, and you're saying about people doing genre. You, you want to work for the big ones. You want to work like DC and Marvel. So you try and create something that sort of mirrors or or, or is themed within that sort of world. But then people are going, oh, you're trying to be too much like so-and-so. It's like, but if I want to break into that industry, I have to fit into their criteria, their world. And so you just find yourself stuck and, and with... That... So I was going to say, oh, if go you're finding yourself stuck with um, the attitude of, do I create something new that nobody's seen before? And will anybody respect that product because it doesn't match up to what they're expecting? You know, does somebody want something new? Or do I try and fit in with it? The, the category, uh, you know, try and fit in with Marvel and DC or try and fit in with Clive Barker and Stephen King because I know it's uh, it's got the readability there. That's, and, you know, this is this other thing, and tell me about this, what your thoughts on this is that, so here's the other part. It's not, it's not just, like, it's not just, be, like, a lot of people would say, oh, you're doing that because you want to, you, you have essentially Marvel, well, I'm using yeah. comics as an example, right, but it could be anything. You've got um, thus and such, uh, fill in in the brackets, uh, pro media, entertainment media product, Envy, right? So it could be filmmaker Envy, it could be mainstream author Envy, it could be genre fiction comics Envy, well, whatever it is, you have that Envy in brackets. Yeah. So that's why you're doing superheroes, or that's why you're doing westerns, or that's why you're doing horror. You're not a real artist because you should be doing this stuff 
about like and you should be dumping all the real existential angst of your life in there and talking about how your mom had cancer or whatever it is and that's it like and if you don't do that then well basically you're just aping junk genre dime store novel yeah aspirations and that's that's not art and it's like no actually there's some of us who actually love the western or love the vampire or love the whatever and yeah. and and no that's that's what like i you know i love science fiction or whatever it is and that's why uh you're doing it right and and this and it's very interesting to see where people kind of poo poo all this genre stuff and really like it, it should be totally okay to have room for all of it i mean that's oh, it the point it's it's the fact that it's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, you look at you look at uh, people like Edgar Allan Poe. You look at artists like Picasso. People that are famous after their death. People who, at the times when they created, um, people that created such amazing works or works that are highly respected now, when they created it, people people didn't respect what they were doing. People didn't like what they were doing because it was it was new or it was different or it didn't fit in with what they were expecting ideas of, of what they're doing and it's it's the fact that now we're in the middle of this sort of uprising yes. of all of these indie creators and people are there saying oh that's not art or oh that's not good enough and it, it literally comes down to the fact that right now what we're looking at may not be what you want or may not be what you feel you give it 10 years time this may be you know considered one of the most beautiful art forms that was ever created we don't know. You never know what the future is going to hold. But it's the fact that it's been happening for hundreds of years and we still haven't learned from that. And we haven't learned to not say, that's not good enough because I don't like it. It doesn't work like that, you know. It's yeah. it's just, it's such a subjective, being creative is such a subjective world to work in. It's, well, I mean, there, there's, there's criteria for quality and there's criteria for saying, this needs to be better, right? But, yeah. where, but where this falls apart, and I don't know if this is, I want to speak for you, but like, is, or so, but it sounds like what you're saying is like, you know, we can all aspire to cri criteria of, of quality, but, but when you start saying like, you know, horror is not an art form or horror is, or this is not a, a, a quality, you know, it doesn't uh, measure up to some literary yeah. standard, that's absolutely, you know, wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that right? Because it's, yeah, yeah, because it, it is, it's just, um, it is things like that. It's like when it's a different art form to something yeah. else or when it's it's something brand new and nobody quite understands it yet and everyone's like, that's not good enough. We've not looked at the technicality behind it and not looked at the, the ideas behind it or the, or the feeling or the love behind the product. They just sort of go to, this is different. It's not good enough. And, and like you're saying, it's like um, it's like working with, like looking at stuff that, that Pete does, Pete Palmiotti does, and the kind of things he's worked on in the past. The style that he works on is so incredibly different to what you do. And yeah. the way that you work and the way that you create is so different. Because, I mean, your art is bright and colourful and powerful imagery. And you, can, you, could, you could go past the page and not see all of the intricacies of what you've done. But, like, with previous podcasts that we've done and talks that we've done looking at the layers and the way that you create the art and the, the, the sort of processes you go through just to do one image. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's having that understanding because somebody could flip past that and not know the laborious hours you've taken just to create that one piece. But then when you come down to sort of discussing with somebody, actually, this is what it's taken to create this image. You get a whole new respect for the art form and for what you're trying to create. Um, and it, you know, it's it's just a shame that people still can't see past that. It's much better than it was, but but it's it's still there. There is still that animosity between people, and and saying this isn't good enough. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, it, it maybe that those kinds of um, false divisions are always going to be there, be if even just because some people really need to feel like. I mean, there's another way to look at this, which is that the genre always gets. Um, I don't know if you can hear me okay. Hopefully, you can. yeah, yeah. I've just taken my headphone off slightly because my hair is getting in the way. Okay, because there's some sound in the background. I just want to make sure you can hear. No, I um, okay. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, there, it is also true that genre material always have a mass appeal. I mean, that's what genre stuff is. 
in central it's mass market stuff and um so it can also be very stressful and annoying and and probably uh you know bring up a lot of hard feelings when people say like jesus i'm trying to write something that actually is unique i'm trying to do something maybe experimental or personal and jesus like the sci-fi book like just it pushed me out of the way again mm. you know or whatever and you know so i think it's also healthy to say you know um you need to respect that and to and to be sympathetic to that and but i think it can feed uh, a lot of both academic and professional antagonism i'm not yes. going to call it jealousy because actually i don't think there's jealousy involved at all but i do think it can lead to a tremendous amount of antagonism and then that antagonism can feed a, 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 a kind of a uh, a sort of um, like okay now we're going to appoint ourselves these higher Higher, higher evaluation of art and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, as well, a way to combat mainstream, you know, yeah. deluge, right? Exactly. But like you, uh, I was going to say, it sort of then links back into quality, like you were talking about before. Because I mean, uh, one of the problems that we do find in the industry is you'll write things for books and you'll get rejected, and that's more the than way you'll it's ever meant get to published, be. right? Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm, no, I've done quite well actually for, for an author. No, but no, no, no. I meant, uh, I meant in the uh, sort of the. Oh no, in the scale really of thing. Great. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. You, you'll be rejected more. Yeah. But the problem is, it's, it's it's the attitude that you take to it. It's either you understand that you are in a position to keep on learning and keep on improving, and you take that opportunity to make something better, or you turn around, stamp your feet, and say, "How dare you not accept this? This is good enough." And right. and and that's that's the other problem that we're having is is so many people that either lose faith in themselves because they're not willing to go out and learn more or they're angry because they think everyone else is against them because they're not willing to go out and learn more right also to be truthful though and to be honest it's there's uh there's a lot of like i need to feel inspired i can't do this yet because i'm not inspired uh, I have art block, whatever it is, and you know, yeah. there are there are definitely people who have, uh, you know, depressive problems, have uh, um, anxiety problems, who have, who also have, frankly, time management issues because, mm -hmm. like, what if you have a job, kids, blah blah blah, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Like, maybe you only have time to write one hour a day. If you can't get to it, well, then you just got blocked, right? But then there's also a lot of creative block, which is really saying. I'm, I don't have my scheduling worked out and scheduling including the days that you don't feel like it because the real writers, they write every day whether they feel like it or not, right? And yeah, all the artists draw anything. whether they, right. Even if it's like you draw a page of thumbs or you draw like a little tiny card, right? <laughs> little drawing, right? Hey. But, you, but you do that, right? Oh and God, yeah. I, on my days where I don't feel like it, I write limericks. Right. So if you see limericks popping up on my Facebook, that's right. a day when I've struggled to write something, I'll write something different. But as we all know, the professional writers, they're working on their novel every day, whether they're like dying or not, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you're about to engage in that process because I know you and I know that that's what's going to happen. Once you get, <laughs> yes. once you're on the roll with that book, with Lux, that is going to have yeah. to happen or it's not coming out when you say it is no so all that being said um there's also it, it is incumbent on the creator to say well you know uh, did i work on it today no so and i'm calling out myself because like a whole year went by without holiday while we were trying to market it and i had a mixture of health problems i had a mixture of life stuff that happened but in the end i could have chosen to have said i know i have life problems i know i have mental illness problems i know i have any number of problems uh, including fibromyalgia weakness that just like paralyzes sometimes but i still got to get at least those four hours in. i chose yeah. not to do that i made that choice and i have to and that's the things you know off by you know, because of that because of that choice um so those are that's the other side of it, right? It's like you know, we have to bolster ourselves against outside depressions and and sort of like tear downs from you know people that don't understand it. But then we also have to measure up our own and, and really stick to our own, uh, stick stick to those schedules and things that we we must. Yeah. 
if we don't we don't produce right so yes no no you don't you don't get there if you don't if you don't stick to something i mean i have a list of about 15 things that i have to do this year and that's only as far as january i've got this list yeah and i'm getting through one a day um at the moment i'm trying to get through one a day <coughs> and that's what i've set myself as my challenge and i've stuck to it so far i didn't make it through nino rimo in november i wanted to get oh my i wanted to get 50 i wanted to get 50,000 words done and i had that just seems like a, a just like a setup for failure that that to me <laughs> I, I managed 11,000 words and then i had my own personal trauma happen in november which oh, yes, of course. i didn't want to write yeah I, I had crap happen that i didn't want to deal with yeah. i didn't want to write and i i shut down and i ended up back on antidepressants again um and good yeah so for, it, good for you for taking them if you needed them uh i did yeah. i did need them um i'm i'm doing a lot better now and i just needed to i had to stop i couldn't so, i couldn't do anything at the time and i had a lot of support from friends that were like yeah if you need to go get help go get help and i did i did and i'm happy i did um, right that's the other half of it that's the other or that's the other third of the process too which is that sometimes things exceed our grip and that exceed yeah. our ability to just fight through um jack uh man tenny who's in the uh, youtube chat said you know well breaks are good too because of burnout and stuff and that's right i mean in fact you know, that's that's the, this is the other balance which is like you cannot just pile drive through this stuff all the time no and not expect you to some kind of crash to happen and so that's the other thing which is like you have to sort of say and this is where scheduling becomes important is to say part of the schedule is you know like saturday is out of the it's don't even bother to try to like ask me to do show on saturday yeah. or you know it's like family time is sunday or whatever it is you know you have to recharge there can't be a no recharge so yeah. that's the other thing about creative stuff is the part of the schedule i'm talking about that that really needs everyone needs to follow it, it, it is a supposed to ensure productivity has to include also the time when you're not productive Right. It's so mentally taxing, more so because people just think like, like, it's like as somebody who doesn't draw, I can't comprehend how hard it is for you to transfer those ideas to paper because I can't, I can't do it myself. I can't comprehend that. So to me, it's it seems like you know it's it, it's a, it's something of ease to somebody, but I can't understand how incredibly mentally taxing that would be for you, and how you will need that recharge just from creating that. Um, yeah, part of it is because uh, doing comic art is very specific, weird, weird stress because you are the writer in the end because your visual interpretation is in fact the final storytelling. Yes. Um, all the stuff in the last 30 years of writers being uh, predominant against the artists is ridiculous and subverts the entire mechanics of how the art form works. It would be like if the writers were more important, were suddenly in vogue more important than the directors were filmmaking. It, it, it's okay to, to idolize Alan Moore. It's okay to idolize Neil Gaiman. It's okay to idolize whoever it is that you're, you're Gail Simone, but in reality, none of those people are anything other than unpublished script writers unless there's a visual head to the end of it because it's a comic book, right, yeah. or a movie or a television show. So the thing is, um, we're not only invested in just pure drawing, but we're invested in rewriting. We're rewriting exactly. the script the final time. You are. So, you're, just, you're just creating this this whole other format for us to understand. Right. So so that being, and I, this is not like, oh, and so I'm such a cool person. No. In no, fact, no, it's no. Really, it's really hard. I mean, it's really, it's out of work. And sometimes I don't want to do it anymore. But one of the things is like, but, it, but it's interesting how many people don't understand that. And mm. and and because of the fundamental flaw of that new viewpoint, uh, particularly post uh, Robert Robert Hickman with uh, <coughs> Kirkman with um, uh, with the uh, Walking Dead, it has set in stone within the agent community and the movie and television uh, money community that the entirety of comics is this written form and that either uh, like a machine makes the art or essentially grunt slave labor draws it. 
and we're completely interchangeable at this point and being thrown on a dung heap when it's writers that are making all the deals when it should be the combined oh it should be it should totally be deal. but where that's and that's also reinforcing in the public that again oh, oh writers make comics it's like no 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 <laughs> writers make half of a comic well actually writers make a third of the comic but, but effectively half of the comic the other half is made by these people and um and they're the final creative gatekeeper on the thing you know, they're the final reason why you think it's cool yeah. Um, that, and but Let's however, th that being the case, though, I can't imagine sitting down and writing how many words in a novel, mm -hmm. minimum, uh, and the year or two years or three years that it takes to produce the novel. I can't imagine going through that. I can't figure how that would. I mean, I think it would be it would break me. Um, so I admire. That's where I admire the other the other side, which is yeah. you know all that. Because um, in that particular area, you don't have me to take on half of the burden of making sure that people love the story. They are loving or not loving the story completely on your shoulders, and that's a lot to take on. Yeah, it's, it's, responsibility. it's scary. It's very scary. That's the, yeah. Sort of linking back to the art again. Um, it's like they do say, "Don't judge a book by its cover," but that cover is what makes you pull that book off the shelf and open it. Well, that's a whole other thing, which is literally yeah. something that has. I mean, it does have something to do with the book, but really, <coughs> it doesn't. It's not mm. the book. It's not the book at all. It's not the book at all. But it's what makes <coughs> fact, it up. In, in, right. In fact, half the time, still to this day, mm. many book covers are are random. <laughs> A random, um, random shelved um, stock art that mm. may have been accumulated by an art director saying, "Oh, yeah, these are going to be good for cover. just junk, but like good art." But but sometimes not even for the book, which has um, been going on since like at least the nineteen forties, fifties when the paper. So like you could have this book that you wrote that's really great and. Uh, a publisher might be like, well, we already paid for this artwork from three years ago for a book that didn't happen, but we think it really would go well with yours. It's okay if we put this artwork on your cover. And they might have to do, you might have to be okay with that because you don't have enough decision making power. No, no, exactly. I got, I, yeah, so anyway, I, so talk about like a situation. I think you guys have it far more tenuously and far more stressful and far worse because what happens if an art director or a publisher is bad? What happens if the art they choose is inferior? Yeah. Um, that could make or break you, right? Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, uh, so, you know, fortunately you have a pile literally of highly qualified artists that you can draw on if you wanted to put your foot down with a publisher and say, you no, know, actually I want to work with this. Yeah. Right. So that, and probably that's also one of the strengths of working, in, in being under the, the, the sort of tent of indie, smaller yes. indie, right? Because the smaller you are, the smaller the publisher, the more leeway you have over them because they're not giving you a, they're not giving you a, a um, what do you call it? A, Ultimatum. Paying, no, I mean, they're not paying you a, um, they're not paying you a, a, a like a bonus, a, a, yeah. an, an initial bonus or any of that stuff. So they, so maybe you have, at least you have that kind of push pull with them, right? You could yeah. say, no, 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 none of that. You know, no, not that, not that artwork. But yeah. I think the higher up the food chain, the more the more choices, you, the less choices you may have. Yeah, I've just realized what time it is. <laughs> oh, you you're at uh, what? You're at nine? No, you're at eleven. Eleven? Okay. <laughs> so. Yes. I say, so, yeah, my housemate's going to get to bed soon. <laughs> um, I would. Would you be interested in continuing this conversation on Monday or Definitely. Tuesday? Uh, would you I can, be interested in part two? I can do it on Monday. I just can't do Tuesday. Monday. Okay, so Monday at 2 o'clock? Sure. I mean, at, or do you need earlier? Because earlier is okay. No, later is okay for me. Later oh, is better. Of the, because, I, of the, oh, because of the time job. difference. So and job. You, need, you need what, more like 6 o'clock your time? Um, two, 2 p.m. your time makes it 7 p.m. my time. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay, let's have a part two because we're getting into some really good stuff, and I don't think I think this needs to this needs a part two. 
Okay, I can. I'm up for part two. Okay, and then you can read some of your book, by the way, as well, which we awesome. didn't get to, we didn't get to do. So uh, this is I'm going to say uh, thank you to Pippa Bailey again. Pippa Bailey, uh, horror author, marketing and social media promoter, and one half of the YouTube podcast The Ghoul Guides, which after you are done watching this live or taped, you should immediately run over there to that channel and. <laughs> And like literally a hundred thousand things to buy, which is hopefully the outcome of that. Um, uh, UK horror writer, reviewer, YouTube personality, uh, my friend, extremely beneficial to Holiday Mountain Madness's progress in that, in that year, and continues to help us out, um, and helps other people out here creative too. And a what was it again? Super. A super backer on Kickstarter. Super backer on Kickstarter. Um, and actually, I'm going to make a note about Kickstarter because I want to talk to you about all this new stuff with Flip and with Kickstarter Gold. Um, and so, yeah, this is only part one of our conversation, a really in-depth interview with Pippa Bailey, which I think is deserved. And uh, we will pick this up again on Monday mm -hmm. at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which would be 7 p.m. GMT. 7 p.m. GMT. And again, you can find all of her links down below, pippabailey.co.uk, her Amazon page, you should buy all of her books. And uh, no, really, because if you watch this interview, you don't buy at least one thing from her. Um, I'm calling <laughs> you out. You're a lame lightweight. <laughs> and you're, you're full of shit from your ass to your mouth. So if you really <laughs> want to promote independent creators, you got to go down there and you got to click the button and you got to pay for the book because that's how you support us. It was a last point on uh, Jason Burbaker of uh, his podcast and uh, said very, very, very clearly, um, he had an interview with another comic creator. It was like, all the likes in the world are awesome, but you must first buy, then share, then like. Buy, share, and like in that order. Because if you don't buy from us, then we're SOL, and it doesn't help us because this is where we're making our bread and butter, right? So mm. anyway, that being said, uh, it's been really, really great for part one. Thank you so yes. much for being here. No problem. And, and thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you, audience, for, for listening to... Let me, uh, do, let me do my <laughs> incredibly high-budget... Uh, there we are. Um, oh, you've, you've, oh, yay! <laughs> exactly. Thanks a lot. So this has been uh, part one of Flame Ape Interviews, Pippa Bailey. And thank you so much, Pippa. And thank you, everybody, uh, for being here tonight. Oh, there Bye. We go. Goodbye. I think there we go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night.